Hi, it's Dwyer. It's October 30th, 2024. Day before Halloween. Trick or treat. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk Daniel Dubois. Let's talk the IBF's top 10. They've granted him a voluntary. As long as it's against someone in the top 10 of their rankings. Let's look at the guys in the top 10 and ask ourselves the question. Let's play manager. How can Dubois maximize his income? Given that Anthony Joshua has decided to wait to see who wins Fury Usyk before going further. We know what that means. Joshua is hoping Tyson Fury wins that match so he and Tyson Fury can then have a blowout event in Wembley that is almost certain to be a sellout. So let's talk about it. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me also point out too, and it's a sign of the times. I'm actually on the road. I'm not even in the state of California. But thanks to modern technology, check out the background. I can take the show on the road, so we'll have at it. Right tomorrow, you won't be seeing me here on YouTube. I'm going to be out with some young kids trick-or-treating. But uh, let's get this video out so we have something to talk about as the calendar turns to November. So the IBF Top 10. Let me say this. I consider Dubois to be blessed offensively. But he's not blessed defensively. If he runs into the wrong guy, he could have problems. Right? Joshua was unable to establish his jab. Joe Joyce and Usyk both established jabs against him. Right? The Usyk fight is troubling because Usyk, of course, is a southpaw and Usyk was winning that fight before Usyk, in my opinion, got dropped off a legitimate shot uh, to the body. Uh, but then when he got back up, he actually started dominating the fight again. So Dubois has a double problem. A slugger who knows what he's doing might be able to blow him out, exploit the fact that Dubois' defense is suspect. Right? If you want a fight to serve as an exhibit for that theory, look at the Philippe Ergovic fight. Just sit down, look at the first round, Count the right hands that Ergovic lands. Look at the second round. Count the right hands that Ergovic lands. You understand, these are grown men. If one fighter is landing six, seven flush right hands on a guy's face, that strategy for the challenger is not sustainable. Right? So let's go through the IBF top 10. And of course in boxing, you know, let's face it. Usyk was boxing the socks off of him. Now, he was right once in that fight and he got the knockdown. The ref seems to have missed it. But then Usyk got back up and got back in the saddle. Right? The problem is against the wrong opponent. Daniel Dubois could be outboxed. Now let me make another point. The flaws make the diamond. Right? We look at fighters, we see flaws, right? We all figured out that Mike Tyson on his back foot probably wasn't blessed. Right? We knew that. We were watching Tyson. Tyson came up so fast. He was so young when he rose to the top that we were looking at Tyson and we thought this guy couldn't be this dominant. And we were looking for the flaws. We saw, particularly after the um, 
earlier part of the 1980s where you had guys like Tony Tucker, Tony Tubbs, Larry Holmes. Right back then, heavyweights seemed to be born with great jabs. Right? Well, just understand, here was Tyson without the great jab, without the long reach. And we were mesmerized. Tyson was box office. He was the biggest story in boxing. He was fighting guys who you knew. If a boxing match broke out, Tyson would have problems. Right? He fought Michael Spinks. He fought Larry Holmes. You understood. Tyson couldn't box with either. He didn't have to. Neither guy made it to the second round of the fight. Spinks, a Hall of Famer, did not make it out of the first round. So you have that kind of dynamic here with Daniel Dubois. While we're figuring out how Dubois can improve his defense, while, while we're figuring out how, how Dubois is going to hang with guys who could outbox him, Dubois, like Tyson, might be winning fights. So the IBF does not have a number one ranked contender right now. Doesn't have a number two ranked contender. Number three is a guy who could outbox Daniel Dubois. His name is Ajit Kabayel. Right? The problem is Kabayel doesn't hit as hard as... Daniel Dubois. Caballel's a risk taker. He's fighting bigger guys and he's deep in the pocket going to their bodies. Let me just say too, you need to profile fighters like you profile serial killers. I'm not kidding. Right? Just like we figured out that Dimitri Bevel likes fighting sluggers because they tend to be more flat-footed. He likes fighting bigger robotic guys because he's more fluid than them. He's defensively blessed. Their punches hit his guard. They don't hit him, even though he looks marked up after fights because they hit his glove and his glove hits his face. Understand, Kabayel is the same way. He doesn't want to fight an Usyk type fighter, right? He would for Usyk's heavyweight title, but he'd rather fight big clunky guys because he then has the foot speed advantage. He's fluid. He's two-handed. He can travel from left to right in a sequence. In other words, he starts a combination. He's over on your left side. He comes over on your right side. He backs away. He's a risk taker. So there he was against the guy whose last name starts with M. I forget it. It's the guy with the neck that he has kind of like a twitch in his neck. Mascara or forget the guy's name. Well, they were both unbeaten entering that fight. And you notice that Kabayel figured out the guy couldn't take body shots. So there's Kabayel against a heavy hitting big guy deep in the pocket riddling his body. Now understand when you're talking about Daniel Dubois you have a lot of films to look at. Not just the Joe Joyce film, not just the Usyk film. You have the Richard Lardy film where Dubois looks tired early. Right? Lardy actually hangs around, lands some shots. You have the Kevin Lorena film where Dubois gets dropped multiple times in the fight. Right? Kabayel might outbox him. So the IBF has stepped in and they have ordered Kabayel to fight Martin Bacoli. <laughs> Martin Bacoli in his next fight. Right, folks? That's going to be a classic fight. Understand, Dubois would have a problem with Martin Bacoli because Bacoli is singular in the heavyweight division. He is a long-range hooker. Right? Consider Danny Garcia who I consider to be a, a future Hall of Famer just lost to Eris Landy Lara. Danny Garcia is a mid-range hooker. Right? Consider Errol Spence 
to be a short range hooker. Spence will actually lean on you and throw hooks. Right? Look at the Spence Chris Algieri fight. Look how close Spence is to Algieri. Look at the um, fight he had against Ugas. Spence is close. Now, what I want people to do is to compare fights like the Spence fight, right? Sp fights like Danny Garcia against Amir Khan. Look at the spacing, and then look at Martin Bacoli against Tony Yoka. You're going to see something remarkable. You didn't really see this in the Jared Anderson Bacoli fight because Bacoli's throwing uppercuts there. But against Yoka, who can move? Bacoli's outside, and he's hitting him with both left and right hooks. Right? Understand, Bacoli can bring the kind of heat that could cause a Daniel Dubois to make mistakes. Also, Bacoli is advanced to the point where, look at the Jared Anderson fight. Bacoli has decided not to defend himself against certain punches. So, Jared Anderson, puncher. Let's give Anderson credit. He's also two-handed. He can flip and fight you lefty. But Bacoli actually allowed Anderson to hit him in the body because Bacoli wanted Anderson in the pocket. Right? That's the dynamic you need to look at for Bacoli's fight against Ajit Kabayel. Bacoli would be a very tough matchup. Very tough for Daniel Dubois. Number five is a chess player on the IBF's list. This guy's a better boxer than you think. But he has the same problem George Foreman had when Foreman ruled the roost. Because he's a quintessential knockout puncher, because he has one of the best punches in the heavyweight division, we somehow ignore the boxing skills that are behind the power. And of course, this guy is a southpaw. This guy, if he's a serial killer, believe it or not, he's looking for big sluggers. The kind of fighter who gives him problems is the kind of slick guy, Jerry Forrest, right, Joe Parker. Those are the kind of guys who give Zhili Zhang problems. Zhili Zhang is the gunslinger looking for the shootout. He would know, he would know that Daniel Dubois is defensively challenged, that Dubois is a shootout guy, right, just like Dubois would only have to be right once. Zhang would only have to be right once. Right? And Zhang is more fluid than Daniel Dubois. One man's video, one man's opinion here. Number six is Frank Sanchez. I need for people to understand. And I know Frank looked bad against Caballero. But I need for people to understand that Frank Sanchez has among the best legs in the heavyweight division, right? I don't know what happened in Frank's loss. He had a really bad night that night, right? But I need for people to understand that a Frank Sanchez might be able to go untouched by Daniel Dubois. He would be top of the food chain with Alexander Usyk in terms of the level of opponent that Dubois has faced based on Dubois style right Frank Sanchez is number six the guy Sanchez beat is number seven Effie Ajaba let me just say this diplomatically like Jili Zhang Effie Ajaba is one of the hardest punchers in the heavyweight division. He might be robotic. He might look obvious. Right? But just understand, if a pocket forms, 
Daniel Dubois, who's defensively challenged, would be in there against a guy who could end the fight on one punch. Right? That's a dangerous matchup. Number eight is Anthony Joshua. Number nine <laughs> is a fighter I disagree with the public on. I call him the heir apparent. He had a bad night against Daniel Dubois, a guy he had sparred with, a guy he landed a lot of shots on. Understand the adjustment Philippe Ergovic would have to make against Dubois. We already know because we've seen the fight that he can outbox Dubois. We already know that he can land power shots on Dubois. So Ergovic is going to have to lean into his shots more. That's the adjustment. Right? He's also going to have to himself. And he's better defensively than Dubois, but was not when they fought. He's going to have to think defensively and not allow Dubois to hit him in the head. Although Dubois hit him in the head fewer times than he hit Dubois, in my opinion. So to me, the fight that Dubois should take is the 10th contender in the IBF. It would be a box office bonanza fight. This guy is savvier than Dubois. We saw that in the last fight he had when he beat Joe Joyce. This guy can bait you into throwing on him so he can counterpunch you. The other problem with this guy is he has had several fights against guys who at some point in their careers, maybe not the night they fought him, but at some point in their careers, held a heavyweight title. Right? Just think about it. He fought David Hay. He fought Vitaly Klitschko. He had, what, three fights or so against Tyson Fury. That's five fights out the gate against guys who had the heavyweight title. He fought Usyk. Right? I'm talking about Derek Chisora. Now, in my eyes, Chisora of all the heavyweights who fought Usyk, gave Usyk his toughest fight at heavyweight. People in the trade, to the boxers watching this video, in the comment section, tell us if I'm right. You can use an alias. You can have a manager or some member of your entourage talk for you. But in the trade, people know that Derek Chisora, believe it or not, is one of the hardest punchers in the sport. Right? He also fought Joe Parker, by the way. Parker had a heavyweight title at one point in his career, had beaten Andy Ruiz. Understand, Chisora fought Parker twice. So you're talking about the KG vet coming off a big win against Joe Joyce where he lures Joe Joyce over to the ropes and then catches him on a counter and drops Joyce. Right, you're talking about a guy with a punch to drop Joe Joyce. Right, who else did that? Jili Zhang? And you're talking about a guy who's box office in the United Kingdom. It would be a British affair. Right, Daniel Dubois against Derek Chisora. Believe it or not, Chisora is in the top 10 of the IBF rankings. He would qualify for a voluntary. Now, depending on who Dubois thinks he is, here are the risks he could take. Right? In my opinion, he has to stay away from Philippe Ergovic. Just has to. They were in the ring. You saw how many punches he got hit with. I believe he has to stay away from Gili Zhang. Right? Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by what Joe Parker did. Parker is much better defensively than Daniel Dubois. Right? You know, Par Parker is facing Deontay Wilder and Gilly Zhang. 
Parker, of course, gets caught in the Zhili Zhang fight, goes down two times. But Parker is the kind of guy who can move around the ring, who knows how to maintain spacing, who's a learner. So when Parker fought Chisora, Parker gets knocked down in the opening seconds of the first round in the first fight. That's as bad as it got for Parker. Right? Parker then clears his head, changes strategy mid-fight in that first fight. Then, of course, Parker decisively wins the second fight. Right now, I need for folks to understand that this is a perception game. The champion has the negotiating power. So if I'm Daniel Dubois, right, if I feel that Kabayel is a smaller man than me, that Kabayel to land body shots on me is going to have to come in the pocket that I can force Kabayel onto his back foot and have him moving away from me. Right? If I feel I'm at less risk with Kabayel than I am with Bacoli, who's advanced, Gili Zhang, who's advanced, Frank Sanchez, who's advanced in a different way. Sanchez, out of all of these heavyweights, is the mover in the group. If I realize that I'm at severe risk with Effie Ajaba, right? We've seen guys go several rounds with Effie Ajaba. But I'm just telling you, if you look at Ajaba's punching power, sooner or later, the opponents fighting Ajaba, except for Frank Sanchez here, feel the power and the fight materially changes. So if Dubois believes in himself, now is the time to get the rematch clause and to take on Ajit Kabayel. Right? The idea is, I have the heavier punch. I'm the heavyweight champion. If I'm just aggressive and I'm coming forward, and if I don't get knocked down, won't some judges particularly the judges who just watched the Baturbi of Bevo fight. Won't some judges favor me? Not only that, if I fight Kabayel as a voluntary and not a mandatory, can I load up the contract so I get a rematch clause? So if I go 12 rounds with Kabayel, and that might not be that easy. But if I go 12 rounds with Caballel, and if the decision is questioned by the public, right, if, if I lose the fight but it's controversial, then I can say, hey, I'm going to exercise my rematch clause, and everyone is going to be enthused about it. Caballel, relatively unknown by a lot of people, certainly not as known as, let's say, Anthony Joshua or Zhili Zhang at this point. Right, now's the time to get that deal with Ajit Kabayel. If I can't, because if I'm Kabayel, I'm thinking, why am I going to fight Martin Bacoli, who's dangerous, when there's not even a title at stake? When I could be fighting the heavyweight champ, and if I win, then I'm the champ. If I win, I leave with the crown. I leave with the belt. Right? So, I've, so if I'm Kabayel, I would leap at the opportunity to fight Daniel Dubois, especially when there's film of Dubois getting cuffed around the ring by the likes of Bridgerweight champion, now Bridgerweight champion, back then a cruiserweight visiting the heavyweight division, Kevin Lorena. So the two guys I target are Derek Chisora, box office, give the British press something to think about. Right, Chisora, bad stamina. Right, he's dangerous for the first six rounds, but after that, he fades. Right, Daniel Dubois is a guy who showed heart the second half of the Gerald Miller fight. Daniel Dubois is more than 10 years younger than Derek Chisora. Right, get the money fighting an older guy 
who's coming off of a much publicized win over Joe Joyce. If I'm Dubois, Derek Chisora's in play, Ajit Kabayel's in play. I would be honest with myself. What I'm going to say is loaded here. I'd be honest with myself. And I would realize that at this stage of my career, right, eventually I'm going to have to fight a Martin Bacoli. Eventually I'm going to have to fight a Gili Zhang. Eventually, Philippe Bergevic and I are going to necessarily have to get in the ring again. I need a fight or two before I'm ready to approach those fighters. I would also realize, too, that Frank Sanchez would keep me chasing him. Frank Sanchez at one point knocks down Effie Ajaba. He's an excellent counterpuncher. Frank Sanchez is kind of like the heavyweight division's version of Devin Haney. Right? Haney, of course, knocked down Regis Progre. Right? You know the kind of fighter I'm talking about. You can't find him in the ring. He's moving. If he gets the knockdown, if he goes the distance, if you're looking frustrated, if you can't land flush, if the copy box numbers are all on his side of the table. If I'm Daniel Dubois, I realize that I could lose to Frank Sanchez. Certainly a decision, right? If Sanchez knocks him down, you can imagine he's going to stick around the pocket as much as Devin Haney stuck around the pocket against Regis Progre after he knocked Progre down. Right? So, I would pick my opponents carefully. I would make sure rematch clauses are in the deal. My choices would be an older Derek Chisora. And understand, the promotion for that fight makes itself. Chisora is one of the best interviews in boxing. Chisora is a boxing historian. Right? You know, Chisora wears hats with the word war on them. That's an homage, believe it or not, to Marvin Hagler, who used to do that years ago. Right? Chisora strikes me as a Mike Tyson type guy who knows all these past champions. Right? Chisora was telling other British fighters, you have the blueprint on what to do against Usyk. Just look at my fight. Right? Unfortunately, his compatriots didn't listen to him. And they've paid a stiff price, right? AJ, two losses to Usyk. Tyson Fury had to get up off the canvas to get his loss to Usyk, right? So just understand, they'd be talking to Chisora, who's a great interview, right? Everyone knows Chisora loves being a dad. Chisora would be able to talk boxing history and would be able to talk about the fights he's he's been in, right? The, the champions... He's faced, and there's several. Right then, he would talk about how this is his last chance to get a title, and how grateful he is to be fighting, to get the opportunity to fight a guy from the UK who has the belt. Right? Caballero's interesting because Caballero fights out of Germany. You know, it might shock some people, but Germany has a lot of fighters. Right, Caballel would actually challenge the UK's stranglehold on at least a portion of the heavyweight title dating back several years. Right, Caballel would be a moment in time. Right, the catch is that to hit you in the stomach, Caballel is going to come in the pocket. And Caballel, while he moves very well, Caballel doesn't move as well as prime Frank Sanchez. That's if Frank Sanchez is still in his prime. His loss looked bad. Right, so those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. Let me also point out too, 
there's talk about Dubois fighting Fabio Wardley. Folks, that's a dangerous fight. How do I put this? Wardley is one of the most dangerous men in the heavyweight division. Right? This is the guy who came up through white collar boxing, not through some amateur system. Right? This is the guy who is straight out of the early part of the 20th century when rich people would pay two guys to have a fight at a private party where they would bet on who the winner was going to be. Right? The thing with Wardley is you don't know what he's gonna do. He's not thinking in terms of foot placement and punch progression and stuff like that. Just imagine a Lennox Lewis, right? Now keep in mind, Lewis, Olympic gold medalist. Right? You know, before he becomes a pro, he's a decorated amateur. Right? You notice Lewis had a great jab. Right? Look at the David Tua fight. Lewis, of course, you know, was always into boxing. One of Lewis's favorite fighters is Ali. Right? Lewis was into Ali's back foot. Little known story. These guys are still alive. The press can question them. Lewis, when he was an amateur, heard about Mike Tyson. So he and his manager, I believe it was Frank Maloney, went to upstate New York and actually sparred Tyson. Right? This, this story is kind of like the Jack Dempsey, Jack Johnson, you know, uh, alleged uh, fight. Well, let's just say it's then that Lennox Lewis figured out, based on styles, that he could beat Tyson. This is years before they actually fought. Right? You know, Tyson would go on to rule the world, but then burn out early. Lewis would then take the mantle from a champ who was highly skilled, who Lewis never fought, Riddick Bo. But Bo didn't have the discipline to keep Eddie Futch, Joe Fraser's Eddie Futch, as his manager. Right? Eddie got tired with Bo. Uh, coming into camp out of shape. Right? Well, just understand, the things that Lennox Lewis thinks about, in my opinion, when he's in the ring, you know, foot placement, how the other guy is leaning, you know, Lewis openly talks about how he was waiting for Razor Ruddick to dip his shoulder, to throw a jab to his body, so Lewis could hit him with a counter hook. And that's exactly what happened. That's how Lewis won the fight. Lewis is waiting for moments. Right? Fabio Wardley's different, folks. This is a different kind of savant. This is the street fighter who is in there, his nose is bleeding, he has some scar tissue in his nose, his nose is bleeding. He's not as structured as a Lennox Lewis is. So understand, when other guys who are structured, Shannon Briggs, for example, fought Lewis, they're playing a game with each other. Briggs was advanced. They're playing a game with each other where they're seeing the other guy's foot placement and how the other guy's leaning and, you know, how the other guy blocks certain shots and stuff like that. That's not a game, in my opinion, Fabio Wardley plays. He's the wild card. Folks, no one is more dangerous than a wild card. You don't know what he's going to do. Wardley only has to be right once. Well, fortunately for Dubois, Wardley's ranked number 12 by the IBF. He's not in the top 10. So politically, Dubois can avoid Wardley for now. Right, folks? Wardley would be a very dangerous fight. Extremely dangerous fight for Daniel Dubois. Right? Wardley is one of the most dangerous men in the heavyweight division. 
So if I were advising Dubois, given these choices, by the way, the 11th ranked IBF guy is Otto Wallen, right? The 8th ranked is Anthony Joshua. If I were giving him advice, I would say, hey, player, if you think you're the future, let's get Ajit Kabayel out of the way right now. Right? Fight him here. He's ranked number three. Fight him here. If you get the knockout, we never have to fight him again. <laughs> if you lose the fight, this is our opportunity to load up the contract so that we have a rematch clause and we have it in a venue that's favorable to us. I would not even think about fighting Martin Bacoli at this stage. He's too advanced. The other fighter I would think about fighting is Derek Chisora. Right? But be aware of the dynamic. No one roots for Goliath. Right? Even though Derek Chisora has been in the ring with several heavyweight champions, right, or guys who at some point in their careers would go on to hold the heavyweight title, right? I'm not saying Usyk was heavyweight champion when he fought Derek Chisora. But even though Chisora has been around and Chisora has, you know, much more experience than Daniel Dubois, Right? Just to understand the old man would be the fan favorite. Right? Dubois would be <laughs> Dubois would be getting the same treatment George Foreman got in the 70s. Young, muscle bound, Goliath type guy. Right? You know, people aren't gonna show up and root for him. They're gonna root for the old man. Right? They're gonna root for Derek Chisora. You know, Dubois needs to realize that if that fight is remotely close going into the championship rounds, he's going to need a stoppage to win his title, to keep his title. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. Tell us if you were Frank Warren, if you were advising Daniel Dubois, and understand, in the world of boxing, how ridiculous this world is, right? Frank Warren, of course, has his own agenda. Fighters like Gili Shang, for example, are Frank Warren fighters, right? This is the life we chose, right? You know, so understand, Daniel Dubois is going to get advice from some people who might have conflicts. Just food for thought. If you are Daniel Dubois' manager and or promoter, who would you want him fighting next? The goal would be to have a successful defense, to make a lot of money, to look good doing so. Right? If your fighter believes he's great, if he has an explanation for why he lost to Joe Joyce, as to why he lost to Usyk, as to why he got knocked down by Kevin Lorena, as to why he looked tired against Richard Lardy, right? And if he believes he's the best, then this is an opportunity to use the voluntary to fight a guy who you know is going to be a tough opponent, but to do so on your terms where you get the venue, you get the rematch clause, you get most of the money. The fight doesn't go to what's called a purse bid. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.